Okay, so what we learned last time was that actually the seemingly innocent first fundamental form actually knows a lot about the geometry of the surface itself. For example, it knows everything about lengths of curves and areas of regions, okay, on a surface, on a given surface. Well, this suggests that the right thing, remember, this is a kind of a principle I've already stated sometimes. Every time you define objects in mathematics, I would say, not just in geometry, then the dream of every mathematician is to classify this object up to something, okay? And you, you see it everywhere. Vector spaces, so a finite dimensional vector space over R is isomorphic to R to Rn, okay? Uh, every finite group of that, that type is isomorphic to one of this list. Okay, every topological space with this, this, this property is homeomorphic to. Now you see I'm listing this because of course every time you, 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 uh, you, you introduce an object, implicitly you are introducing also an equivalence relations among objects. Okay, so topological spaces were classified up to homeomorphism. When you study topology, you said, well, these two topological spaces are the same. Maybe they look completely different but there is an identification which respects the structure that you are using. Or a vector space, too. It's not true that a finite dimensional vector space is Rn, but it's linearly isomorphic to Rn, okay? Now, what kind of geometry are we doing here? We are doing geometry of some special object, which are surfaces, where we look at properties depending on curve, I mean, tangent vectors, length of tangent vectors, okay? So that means, and we are measuring distances between points, even though we, ever ne we, we never really did it, but in some sense, we, when you measure the length of a curve, somehow you are going in the direction of measuring the distance between two points on this curve, okay? So we are doing metric geometry of this object. So what is the, the equivalence relation that we want to put? So when we say a surface with, for example, positive Gauss curvature is one of the following list. Well, it will be a theorem like, there will be a theorem like this up to something, okay? What is the something? In some sense, in some occasions we have already met, it, met them. Because of course, every time we move R3 with rigid motions, so translations, rotations, reflections, then we consider the object to be the same, okay? So when we say it's a sphere, we don't really care where is the center, okay? We don't really, I mean, the sphere then is of course rotationally invariant, so you don't care about rotations and so on, okay? But now, looking at the first fundamental form, what we learn is that length of curves and areas of region depends on the first fundamental form. So the right notion of equivalence should be something which depends on the first fundamental form because this is the object which measures, for example, distances of points, okay? So in particular, of course, rigid motions of R3 will be good. But we should expect something more in our equivalence group, okay? So what is this more? Well, of course, the word is not surprising. If you are doing metric geometry, the word will be isometries. But what is an isom? How do we define now an isometry? Well, of course, we can take it from the general point of view, but we can also say that two surfaces, S and S tilde, are uh, isometric if, well, in general, let's, let's not talk about the first fundamental form in the definition, but if there is a diffeomorphism meaning a differentiable map one to one with differentiable inverse okay which takes each curve on s to a curve on S tilde of the same length. Okay, 
such an F, of course, if such an F exists, the two surfaces are called isometric, and uh, such an F is called an isometry. Okay? So here the two words are these. So that means you can identify them. Of course, this is stronger than everything below. I mean, two surfaces are certainly topological spaces, and I'm certainly requiring them to be homeomorphic. Okay? They have what we call a differentiable structure, and we are identifying also the differentiable structure. This is something that will be clear at the end of the course, what I really mean. But I mean, so a diffeomorphism is more than a homeomorphism because it's an homeomorphism which is differentiable with the inverse, which is not just continuous, but it's differentiable again. Okay, so it's more than that. Plus, it respects lengths of curves. Okay, so it's a stronger notion than everything else that you can imagine on, on your set. Okay, it's the strongest possible notion of identification. Okay, they really look the same like metric spaces. But now, for what we learned last time, since length of curves depends only on the first fundamental form, we can characterize isometric surfaces by looking at their, at their first fundamental form. So theorem, the theorem is, uh, it's not, I mean, two, in fact, notation which I, I think we have already used, but let me call a patch. What is a patch of a surface? Of a surface is the image of x from mu to s for a local chart. So we have a local chart. The part of the surface covered by this so th this piece of the surface covered by x, I call it a patch okay? of x for a local chart x. Okay? So this is just a word just to avoid writing every time all this sentence. Okay? So now the theorem, I want to state it in this way. Two patches. Two patches of surfaces. S and S tilde. Okay, are isometric isometric if they can be parameterized can be parameterized by one x from u to s and another x tilde from the same u to s tilde in a way that the first fundamental forms Coincide. Okay, now such a statement requires a comment. So what are we saying? We have two surfaces which maybe look completely different. Okay, one is something like this, and one is something like this. Okay. I'm not looking at the whole surfaces. I'm saying a piece of this, which I know it's it's the image of some local chart, but I don't, with, I don't even want to write which chart. So I take a, an open subset of this surface and an open subset of this surface here, which are sufficiently small to be image of a chart. Okay? Now, these two pieces of the surfaces are isometric. Of course, a, an open part, an open, I mean, a patch of a surface is a surface. So I can say, I can do whatever, all my theory I can restrict the theory from S to this piece. Okay? So these two pieces, if I look at them as surfaces by themselves, are isometric. If I can parameterize them, if, if there is 
if there are two maps, but from the same, so here there are many important, you see, the domain of the two charts, which in principle were completely different. I mean, starting from the fact that these were patches, here there was a U and here there was a V. Okay, now I'm saying they are isometric if and only if, sorry, here, if and only if, okay, I can find another chart, which is good, I mean, of course the charts will be different, how do I call it? X and X tilde, but defined on the same domain, which work for these two things, because now, if they are defined on the same object, on the same domain of R2, of course, the coefficients of the first fundamental form of this piece are functions over here. The coefficients of the first fundamental form of this piece are functions over here, over the same domain. So now I can compare them. If they were defined on two different things, how can I say E is equal to E tilde? They have even a different domain. Now, E and E tilde have the same domain. Okay? So I can, I can ask, well, are they equal or not? And now I'm saying, once I do this trick, something is isometric if and only if the coefficients are the same. Okay, they are really the same function. So E is equal to E tilde, F is equal to F tilde, and G is equal to G tilde. Okay? So now, at least the statement of the theorem must be clear. Because actually then the proof is almost... It's very simple once you understand what, what we are saying. If I let me erase, well, the picture may be, might be useful, so. Proof. Um, well. In one direction, there is all, there is, it's essentially what we observed last time. So, if these maps exist and the, first and the coefficients of the first fundamental form are the same, which will be the isometry? Okay? Now I, I need to go so in this direction. So let me go from, from bottom to top. Okay, so let me say it in this way. Okay? So now I know that this picture exists, and if I measure the coefficients here are the same, okay? So I now I need to prove that they are isometric, so I need to construct for you a map F, not between S and S tilde, but just between this piece and this piece, okay? Well, how do I do it? I take this point, I take it back, and I go here, okay? I have these two maps, which are invertible, differentiable, everything, everything I want. So now the only thing is to convince yourself that this is an isometry. Okay. But what, what does it mean to be, to have the same? So what should I check? I should take a curve here. I should measure its length on S. And then I should take the image and measure its length. And then I should argue that they are the same. But why this is true automatically for what we know? Because I write the length of this, instead of measuring it here, by what we did last time, both curves essentially correspond to the same thing here. Okay? And the distortion between the length here and the length here is measured by E, F, and G. By E, F, and G are the same for S and S tilde. So there is nothing to prove. The length of these two curves are the same by brute force, by what we observed last time, okay? So in this sense, there is, once, once you understand what you are proving, there is nothing to prove, okay? Let's see the other way around, because now, so going the other way, the other direction needs a bit more care, because now I know I start with two surfaces, two patches of surfaces which are isometric. So now I know that there is a map here, F. And now the problem is to construct X and X tilde, so this seems more difficult, okay? How do I do it? 
Well, the first patch, so start with any patch, sorry, any local chart. Let me call it x because I, the first one will be free. The problem will be to construct the second adapted to this. So the tilde adapted to this one without tilde. So start with any local chart x from u to s uh, covering the patch on s that we are studying. Okay, so we start with some, something like this exists. Okay, now the problem is how to complete the picture on the, with the tildes. Okay, well, what, what, what do I do? I force the picture before to be true. Meaning, now define x tilde to be what? Now, it has to be defined on the, over the same u, otherwise it's useless. So I'm trying to define something like this, okay? And I do what? So x tilde is f composed x, okay? Now this looks very good, but, so this will define, you see, notice that I don't know exactly the image. So that means in this statement, which is not really mathematical, it's very English, okay? That means that the second, I cannot prescribe exactly the second patch, okay? So the second patch is determined by the first, in some sense, okay? Now, now what do I have to check? I knew that f was an isometry. I need to check that if I write the, second, the, the coefficients of the first fundamental form with respect to x, which basically it's nothing because it was any, any chart. So give me e, f, and g as they were born, but now compute e tilde, f tilde, and g tilde for the corresponding chart, okay? But what do I know? That f is an isometry, okay? That means, that means that if I, since f is an isometry, for any curve here, for any u of t, v of t curve in u, so whatever, now I fix this curve here, <coughs> the length of the curve, of the image curve here, and the length of the image curve now, of course at the end I'm going to do this, but really the way I want to see it is send it to S and then send it here, okay? Since this one does not change the length of curves, the length of this and the length of this are the same, but X tilde is the composition. So the length here and the length here are the same of this. But what is the length of both curves if you want? Well, I have two surfaces now, so I can write it in two ways. Once if I look it here and once if I look it there. So this is telling me, so suppose I pick a curve which is parameterized in some interval A, B, it doesn't matter. Okay, in fact, let's take zero epsilon, okay? Let's take uh, any little piece of any little curve, okay? The length would be what? The, the integral between zero and epsilon of our usual, the old expression, E u prime squared plus 2f u prime v prime plus g v prime squared, everything to one half dt. And this would be the length here. But the length on the other side is the same formula with the tildes. So this would be the integral between zero and epsilon of e tilde u prime squared plus 2f tilde u prime v prime plus g tilde v prime squared one half dt. Okay? But now this has to hold for any function, cup pair of functions, u, u v. So, of course, now it's just a matter of choosing 
at every point. So now, for every point, because I need to prove that E, F, and G are the same at every point. So I pick a point. And then I, pick, I take which curves? Well, let's try the coordinates and see what happens. Okay? So if I fix, so fix now u not v not a given point in u. Okay? And then I look as curves, I look at, look at, now let me write it in this way because I will make a few cases. Okay, I take the curve u not plus t v not. That means keep v fixed. So if this was the point, now I'm moving in this way. Okay. What does it happen if I put it in, in the formula? This implies what? So that in particular means v prime is equal to zero. V is constant. Okay. So every time you see v prime, poof, disappears. So it, what is left? It's left the integral between zero and epsilon, and actually u prime is equal to one. Okay. So that means you get the integral between zero and epsilon of e to the power one half dt. This is equal to the integral of e tilde to the power one half dt between zero and epsilon. But this holds for any epsilon. So take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and you get what? What is the limit of the integral? If you take any function, now I call it f uh, h, okay? The limit as epsilon goes to zero of this integral is what? Zero. zero. Sorry, divided by epsilon. No. Yeah, divi sorry, sorry, divided by epsilon, one over epsilon. Okay. Right, but that implies exactly that e at u naught v naught is equal to e tilde to v naught, u u naught v naught. Okay. Now this was good for e. What will be good for g? Well, the other coordinate. Okay. So you take u naught v naught plus t. And this gives g, because now u not u prime dies, and v prime is one. Okay, so this implies g is equal to g tilde. And once you know that e and g are the same, then you can do f. And what do you? So this would be good for g. Now, once you know it's good for the two axes, you do the bisectrix. Okay. So now you get you take u naught plus t, v naught plus t. Of course, this will be more complicated because what 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 I mean this implies u prime is equal to one, v prime is equal to one. So if you put it here, everything survives. This becomes the integral of e plus two f plus g is equal to the integral of e tilde plus two f plus g tilde. But now you know that e and f are the same. E and G are the same to E tilde and G tilde. So those pieces disappear and you are left with F. Okay? Okay. End of story because now we proved what we. Now, for ex I mean, let's do quickly. Yes? So the question is where in this uh, one that I haven't written? Well, so let me repeat the argument quickly. How do I prove that if, if I have two charts defined on the same domain with the same coefficients of the first fundamental form, then, then actually what I drew here is an isometry. Okay? That was, so basically the idea was. 
No, the idea was now I have to prove, I have the map. The map is, is essentially given, okay? Because now remember that the, the map was constructed. I, X, I have X and X tilde. So I define F to be X tilde of X inverse, okay? So now I have to argue that this is an isometry. How do I do it? Well, an isometry means pick any curve, measure its length here. Take the image, measure its length, it's the same. So how do I argue? Well, I take these two curves, so one, one curve and its image, and I take them on the domain U. The point is that they come from the same curve by construction. So there is one curve here which goes here and here. Now, if the coefficients of the first fundamental form are the same, the lengths, okay? So let me quickly, because I don't want to lose too much time on, uh, let me quickly give a non-trivial example of this situation. If you take, for example, oh, uh, sorry, actually the, the, the simplest example, I forgot, maybe we can recover it together. So example one, if you want, is um, a part of the plane so take any strip, for example, pi, 3 pi, of the plane, and take the cylinder. Okay. Think of the cylinder as the surface of revolution of this, uh, I mean, take a straight line here and Rotate, I mean, bend, bend your piece of paper. Now, this map here, this map here is an isometry, exactly because compute the, second, the, first fund, the coefficients of the first fundamental form, and you get the same thing, okay? That's, so let me pass to example two, which is a bit more <laughs> delicate. Oh, well, but actually that means something interesting. Of course, it's not true that the plane, the whole plane and the cylinder are isometric. They are not even homeomorphic. Do you agree? One is simply connected and the other is not. Okay? So, but there is essentially one. But that, that is re reflected in what? Is that if you, if you construct the map from the plane to the cylinder, you go around infinitely many times. Okay, so you cover the cylinder infinitely many times. You have to restrict yourself to a stripe of length 2 pi to cover it only once. Okay, so it's just a topological problem. Besides the topological problem, they are really the same. Okay, so this starts explaining this strange accident, no? Gauss curvature zero, how is it possible? Well, in fact, they are the same. Okay. Let me comment a little more later. Now take the right, the right cone, meaning x, y, z in R3 such that, in R3, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. So how does it look like? This is really, you see, if I cut with z equal to a constant, I get a circle. So this is really the cone in the old fashioned way, not the generalized cone we discussed a couple of times ago. So this is really, this is really this one, okay? And now, okay. Now take this region in, in the plane. In the plane I take the region somehow in polar coordinates given by rho, or I mean, I'm going to give you u, uv, but now I think of u as the polar, as, as the norm of the vector, and v as the angle, okay? So I take u and v free to move in zero plus infinity, 
times 0 pi square root of 2. OK, so how does it look like? Well, of course, so for every point, there is the whole ray. This is the information coming from here. But the angle has to be bounded by 0, so let me do it like this, open, and pi square root of 2, which is something like this. So the whole region, OK, like this. Do you agree? Now construct the map from this region, from this region to the cone, given by x of u v. Basically, basically, it's it's really what you what what you do with your kid to produce this cone with a piece of paper. So here it was just bending the paper and becomes a cylinder. Now, if you want to pr to, to construct a cone, what do you do? You cut with scissors and you glue. Okay. Well, what is the mathematical formulation of cutting and gluing in this sense? This is just u cos v. Oh, sorry. No, no. This is, I can tell you. Uh, so, okay. uv goes to u over square root of 2 cos v square root of 2. u over square root of 2 sine v square root of 2. And u over square root of 2. OK? Now you have to do something also on the plane. So in fact, this would be x for the first one. But I need to construct an x tilde of uv for the plane. The plane, I want to parameterize it in this form. u cos v, v, u sine v. So basically, I have a fixed domain. So now this is really the situation of the theorem. Because you have one domain and two maps. One which goes, to, sorry, 0. Because I think of the plane inside z equal to 0. z equal to 0 is here. So I somehow put this picture in R3. OK? But I do it in a slightly non-trivial way. Okay, so. And now you compute the coefficients of the first fundamental forms, and they and you get that they are the same. Okay. Sorry? The cone is not a regular surface. Good good observation. In fact, I'm doing everything on the upper half or the lower half. I'm, remo I'm never touching 0. So it would be 0, 0, the bad point, no? And I'm never, I'm never touching it, OK? The vertex is, of course, a point where you can see, actually, that this is not a, a regular surface, even by topological reason. There is a point that if you remove it, you disconnect the surface. And this is impossible on a regular surface, no? By topology, OK? OK, so this is just one example, a non-trivial example of the situation we saw in the theorem. Okay, but I don't want to, because actually there is nothing to learn now. You, comp you do x u, x v, x tilde u, x tilde v. You take the scalar product, you check they are the same, and that's it. I mean, there is nothing to learn from doing more than this. Okay? But you can see that the situation starts being more richer than what you might have thought at the beginning. And the other thing you can do as an exercise is to check or try to prove that if you have a developable surface, surface you have an isometry with, um, with R3. OK, now, uh, this was coming from the observation, the important observation that the lengths of curves are <coughs> measured with the first fundamental form. But the first fundamental form measures also something else, if I find it. Namely, angles between tangent vectors. Okay? What do I mean? 
Well, of course, the first fundamental form is not telling you just the norm of a vector. Remember, measuring the length of a curve, measuring integrating the norm of the tangent vector. So in principle, to measure the length of curves, I would need less than the first fundamental form. A bit less. I don't need to know the scalar product between x and y. I just need to know the scalar product between x and x. Okay? So the first fundamental form has something more. Angles. So not just the norm of vectors, but angles between directions. Okay? So let's see if this is leading to something interesting. And in fact it is. So definition. If I look at this, x from u to s, so this is a local chart, is called, then I'm going to give you two definitions. So one, conformal, if it preserves angles. Now I could stop here, but then what does it mean if it preserves angle? Well, we are in this picture. Let's draw here the usual picture. We have our surface S, our patch, and our map X from some domain. Let me draw it big because now I have to put many things inside. What does it mean? a map preserves angle. It means that if I take a point, at every point, if I take two curves passing through this point, but basically, okay, I, suppose I take two curves, but in fact, suppose I take two, two vectors and imagine pointing them at this point here. Of course, using the standard scalar product, I can measure this angle here. Okay? But X, tells me also how to put it here, how to send these two vectors to two tangent vectors to the surface, because I can take the differential of this map, okay? And so here, with the first fundamental form of the surface, I can measure this angle. So something is conformal, x is conformal, if these two things are the same, these two angles are the same at every point for every choice of pair of vectors. Okay, so I can articulate, so that is, let me express it, try to express, so whenever, whenever, whenever you have a curve, two curves, T, going to UT, VT, because now instead of saying I take a point and two vectors, I can also take, I take two curves, no? whose tangent vectors are those, so Whenever I take two curves, t going to u t v t and uh, t going to u tilde t v tilde t, that intersects, that intersect at t equal to zero, for example, I mean, this is nothing, it's just uh, to fix the convention. At an angle, and suppose that they form at an angle. In the plane, they form an angle theta. Their images, x of ut, vt, v, comma, x of u tilde, t, v tilde, t, they of course intersect. At the, at the point x of, z, x, x of u of 0, v of 0, and they form at an angle, at the same angle. So their images in, uh, form the same angle. Okay? This is just an explanation of this picture. Now, definition two. So this is co these are conformal charts. Since we studied also, this still is about tangent vectors, norms, and angles. But since we studied also areas, we say that a chart, a local chart, is called area preserving. I mean, clearly, there could be, in principle, a nicer among all charts those for which 
if I take a region here and I measure the Euclidean area of this, this is exactly the same as taking the image on S and measuring the, the area as we learned last time. Okay? If this happens for any domain inside U, that means that the map is very special. So let's give them an and we call it area preserving. If the area of X of V is equal to the area of V for any V, let's say compactly compactly contained in U, okay? Because in principle U could be even unbounded and so on. So at least for those regions for which it makes sense to compute the area, okay? Well, we can play the same game we did before to try to characterize these charts in terms of coefficients of the first fundamental form because after all we know that all these objects, angles and areas depend on the coefficients of the first fundamental form. Okay? So, and in fact it's possible and it's not difficult so let's do it quickly. Proposition. X is conformal if and only if E is equal to G and F is equal to zero. Everywhere on the domain, these are functions on U. Okay, so on U. And then two, actually, this was proposition one. Proposition two, X is area preserving. <coughs> if and only if EG minus F squared, actually, you can guess it, no? But this is always positive. It's the determinant of the first fundamental form. But I mean, basically what we are saying is that it's area preserving if the map does not change the area. It's constant equal to one. I mean, the distortion is not there. But not there means it's one because it's, uh, okay, it's the function that you put in front of the measure. Okay, so you want the two measures to be the same. Okay, so how do we prove it? Let's do it. Oh, actually, but one comment, because these theorems look uh, different from before. Be before, we had two surfaces, and we were looking at the problem of when these surfaces are isometric, I mean, can, locally at least, on, on some pieces, okay? Now, and, uh, we didn't write something like, uh, I mean, we cannot say E is equal to 1 or, I mean, didn't make sense. Now, this is, like, this is different. The situation here is like before, but when we are comparing the geometry of S, with the geometry of the plane. So it's like if S tilde is forced to be U. Okay? So in principle, we could define conformal maps between surfaces, S, S tilde. And in principle, we could define area preserving maps between surfaces. Okay? And then we would have theorems like comparing, I mean, a conformal map if and only if there is a relationship between E, F, and G, and E tilde, F tilde. So what, I'm trying to explain why here there is not E tilde, F tilde, and G tilde. Where are they? But the point is that here we are fixing the other surface to be this. And for this, there is nothing to, to say. I mean, the coefficients of the first fundamental form of this are 1, 0, 1. Okay? Because comment, before making the, showing you the proof, comment. What if a map is both conformal and area preserving? Well, if, the, if it's both, f is equal to 0. e is equal to g. This means e squared is equal to 1, but it's positive. So e is equal to 1. So basically, it turns out that what? If it's conformal and area preserving at the same time, 
e is equal to g is equal to 1 and f is equal to 0. But these are the coefficients of the plane. So by the previous theorem, this means the surface is isometric to u, to the plane, to this part of the plane. It's an isometry. OK? <laughs> but you see that these conditions are weaker than isom each of them are weaker. Because isometric would mean E is equal to G equal to 1. So conformal is more general than isometric. And of course, area preserving, it's even, I mean, this is just a quadratic equation in these things. Okay? So now let's prove it. Well, it's a, essentially it's enough to write down the formula for this angle. You see, now look again at this picture. So let's prove part one. How much is this angle? The Euclidean angle measured in U. Well, the, the, the tangent vector, so suppose this is, in my picture, this is U of t, V of t, and this other curve is U tilde, V tilde, OK? So how, how much is this angle here, or cos, cos of this angle, which is simpler? Well, I compute the tangent vectors. I take the scalar product, and I divide by the norms. OK, so if I call this angle theta, so it has the definition like. So this is theta, and the other actually doesn't have a name. But let me call it phi, OK? Now. Theta, cos theta is what? Well, cos theta is the scalar product in the Euclidean plane of the two, of the vector u prime, v prime, and u tilde, v tilde. No? I have to take this scalar product divided by the norm. So this becomes what? u prime, u tilde prime, plus v prime, v tilde prime, divided by u prime squared plus v prime squared, one half, u tilde prime squared plus v tilde prime squared. I mean, this is becoming a joke, OK? One half. OK, so this is one of the two angles. How much is the other one? Well, do I, what do I have to do? I have to transport these curves here and compute the tangent vectors, OK? But which are the tangent vectors? Well, the tangent vectors to the first curve would be, let me call it xi, OK? So this vector here would be xi, and this other one would be something else. Have I given a name? Xi tilde, OK? So xi would be what? Xi would be u prime xu plus v prime xv, OK? And xi, xi tilde is u tilde prime x u plus v tilde prime x v. Okay. And now I have to take the scalar product. So now, first fundamental form. So how much is cos phi? By the same principle as before. Now it will be more complicated because I take u prime, u tilde prime, but now x u, x u, so e. Correct me if I do something wrong, eh? because it's likely. Now, this one scalar, this becomes plus. OK, you can see that it will be, two, no, it will be u prime v tilde prime x u x v. Freeze it for a second. Plus v prime u tilde prime x u x v f. OK, plus, now the last one, v prime v tilde prime g. Everything divided by the norms, because this is not, these are not unit in principle. So this is divided by well, a mess. What is the norm of this? It's a scalar product with itself. So this becomes u, t, u prime squared e plus, in fact, well, usually we put, well, it doesn't matter, plus 2 u prime v prime f plus v prime squared g, 1 half then everything else with the tilde. The same, again, I repeat, this was the norm of this. Now, the norm of this is the same 
expression with the tilde. OK? OK. That's it. Now again, it's now the, in these theorems, it's always the same trick. You, have, you write down what you have to. Now what do we know? We know that at every point, and for any tangent vectors, no, you prime, v prime, you tilde prime, v tilde prime, this object, this function, has to be equal to this function. So now it's a matter to plug in this formula the right curves. Okay, so for example, uh, which is the best one at the beginning, consider, take u of t equal to t, v of t equal to zero. Okay, well, this, this is one curve mean, means, of course, well, if you want plus v naught, plus u naught, okay, I mean, at every point, it doesn't matter. Okay? Now, so which curve is this? This is the horizontal curve. And let's take as the tilde the vertical curve. And then I take u tilde t is equal to 0, v tilde t is equal to v, to t. Okay? Now, if I do this, what do I get? Cos theta, well, of course, now I've taken two, the two axes, the angle, I mean, cos phi, cos theta is 0. They are orthogonal in R2, okay? So now, what is this, why this could be interesting? Of course, what, what's, what have we done? V prime is equal to zero, and U tilde prime is equal to zero. So let's see how many things disappear. U tilde prime is equal to zero. Uh, and V tilde, so what is surviving here? This is, this, this disappears. This disappears. This one, no, but this one disappears, okay? And this one is one, okay? So here I get, okay, on one side I have zero because it was cos theta, okay? So zero is equal to what? Is equal to F, well, divided by something, I don't even care. Whatever it is, the something, F is equal to zero. Very good. So we proved half of the theorem. And now, and now take, again, two orthogonal things, but not the axis, the two bisectrics. Meaning, u of t is equal, v of t is equal to u tilde of t is equal to t. And now, v tilde of t is equal to minus t. Okay, so one is this one and the other is this one. They are still orthogonal, of course. So it's again zero equal to what? Well, this, and now we know already that f is equal to zero. Okay, so here what do I get? So u prime is equal to one, u tilde prime is equal to one, so e plus minus g, uh, otherwise it's wrong, 1 minus 1. So e minus g is equal to 0. And that's it. OK? OK, for the area preserving, you play the same game as before. It's the same proof, OK? I don't want to spend. Now, conformal. So you see. Among all possible planar representations of a surface, we have identified, of course, three types of better charts. Of course, if you manage to do isometric, you go home and that's it. But if you can't, maybe you can do a bit less, okay? Actually, these two are not exactly comparable, no? This is not less than this. This is different. Okay? But at least we have three types of 
charts which have some geometric interest. Now, again, I'm going to give you the most famous example of a conformal chart. And then Now, the most famous example of the conformal chart, you know it already, in fact. You never observed because you didn't know what it meant. Now, my surface is the sphere. So I want to give you a special system of charts on the sphere. Each of them is conformal. How do I do it? It's called stereographic projection. What is, actually, there are many stereographic projections, but I mean, just to fix notation, you fix the North Pole, which is essentially any point, but I mean, you, you, call, you take one point and you, def, you call it the North Pole. You pick, so suppose this is, this is really the sphere of center, the origin of radius one, okay? Otherwise, everything is slightly distorted and you can adjust it immediately. Now. You take the z equal to 0 plane, and you do what? You construct a map, pi. Let me call it pi because it's kind of projection, okay? which takes for each point x, y, 0. Okay? You want to construct a map from R2 to S2. Okay. By doing what you know, okay, you take the line, the straight line, passing through P. Let me call this point P. Okay. So I take P and I take the point of intersection between the line and the sphere different from the North Pole. I mean, if I take the line and the sphere, it intersects the sphere in two points. Do you know why? How would you prove it? Well, it's the simplest appearance of, a, of, an, of an important theorem, no? Bezu's theorem. The sphere is of degree 2. The line is of degree 1. So the intersection are two points counted with multiplicity because, of course, there is a possibility that you get only one point, no? But in that case, you count it with multiplicity two, and it meaning it's tangent, okay? So there are only two points. One is the North Pole. By construction, I take the other one, and I call it pi of p. Very well. Are we able to write down the explicit formula for this? Well, it's a simple exercise in uh, analytic geometry. How do, I get, how do I get the expression of this in terms of this? Well, I parameterize this line. So what is this line? This line is n plus t p minus n. So for t equal to 1, I get the point p. And for t equal to 0, I get n. OK, so that means I'm parameterizing this line so this is, of course, a line. So it starts at t equal to 0. It starts at the North Pole. At t is equal to 1, I'm here. So that's good. What, is, what are the analytic components of this line, okay, of this parameterization? Well, this is the point 0, 0, 1. Okay? So this is what? This is tx, ty, 1, Plus t, here I have 0, so minus, so it's 1 minus t. Okay, so this is the analytic expression of this straight line. And now how do I get pi? Well, I need to intersect this with the sphere. So what do I do? I plug these expressions in the equation and see for which values of t I get a solution, which are the roots. I will get a, a, a polynomial of degree 2. 
I consider x, y as fixed. Okay? So now the only parameter is t. The real variable is t. So what does it mean I plug them here? I get t squared times x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 1 minus t squared is equal to 1. So for which values of t this holds? OK, so this becomes t squared, which multiplies x squared plus y squared plus 1, OK, minus 2t plus 1 equal to 1. Not surprised. So this is equal to 0, which means that one root is t equal to 0, which is something I knew, because the North Pole is a solution. OK, so I drop a t. And the other solution is the interesting one. So t is equal to 2 divided by 1 plus x squared plus y squared. And now what do I do? So now what is pi of p, pi of the point p? Well, it's 2x, so t times x, 1 plus x squared plus y squared, 2y, 1 plus x squared plus y squared, and then 1 minus t, which is usually written, so one likes to have always the same denominator, but that becomes minus 1 plus x squared plus y squared. OK. OK, so now you finished your exercise, because now I've done my job. Now you compute the coefficients of the first fundamental form with the, of the sphere with this map. Also, actually, there's just one comment. Which is the image of this map? S2 minus the North Pole. So actually, this chart covers the sphere minus one point. So in fact, it's easy to go. So with two of these charts, I cover the whole sphere. Remember that at the beginning, we cover the sphere. I don't remember with how many, eight, 10, uh, OK? And we, of course, we know that one is impossible because the sphere is compact and the, and the chart, a patch, can never be compact. Okay, so now we know that with two we can do it, and two is optimal. Okay. So now you compute exercise for you. You compute the coefficients of the first fundamental form. Nothing to do. I mean, it's the usual thing. Okay, I just call it x and y instead of u and v, but that's it. And you check that this is conformal. Okay. And this is the most famous conformal map in history. It's actually what we use to produce maps. Okay. In fact, it was known at least to the Greeks, this map. The way the Greeks were making maps of the of the sky meant they knew this map here. Okay? They never wrote it. But, okay? Now, um, what else? Uh, so you see, this map, at least being conformal, you see, that means that at least the problem of directions is faithful, OK? So if you produce a map, a real map, a map, a piece of paper with something drawn on it, using this map of a piece of the Earth, for example, you know that the directions are exactly the same as in reality, OK? So if you look, looking at the map, you tell me, to go to Rome, you have to turn by 35 degrees. That means I have to turn by 35 degrees. But it's not an isometry. So by measuring on such a map the distance between Trieste and Rome, and you tell me it is 800 kilometers, I know that you are wrong. They won't be 800 kilometers. Okay? So depending on which you prefer, do you prefer directions to be preserved, you can do it in this way. If you want the perfect map, it doesn't exist, and we will observe it soon, very soon. 
Okay. Because now you can say, well, okay, now you gave me a conformal chart. Maybe there is an isometric chart. Okay. Okay. Now. We might have time. OK, I'm usually behind schedule, but in fact, how do I prove you that there is not an isometric chart? I mean, between a piece of the plane and a piece of the sphere. Actually, I do it. In fact, Gauss did it by proving probably the most important theorem in the theory of surfaces. Okay. It's the only occasion I know in the history of mathematics that the person who proves the theorem call is, calls it the most important theorem. Okay, usually you expect somebody else to tell you, no? I mean, <laughs> I mean the fundamental theorem of calculus was called fundamental by somebody else. Okay, not by, in fact, I don't even know who was the first one to state it. But in this case, Gauss proved this theorem and he called it, and, it's the, and the name remained because it, of course, it was in Latin, so the theorema egregium, and it's still called like this, okay? Egregium means uh, extremely important, okay, in, in Latin. What does it say? In one sentence, it says this, the Gauss curvature is invariant under <coughs> isometries. If you want to, again, as usual, I mean, this is the, the thing you can put on a stone, but more, a bit more mathematically. What does it mean? That is. If you have two surfaces and an isometry between them, if F between S and S prime is an isometry, with Gauss curvatures <coughs> Gauss curvatures k and k prime, okay, then k of p is equal k prime of f of p for any p. Okay, meaning you have two surfaces and, a, and an isometry between them. Computing the Gauss curvature is invariant if you do it on the left or on the right at the corresponding points. Okay. Now, first, this solves the problem, for example, the king of Denmark problem. Okay. He wanted the perfect map, forget it. Okay. Because if the two surfaces are the plane and the sphere, if there was an isometry, you would have a point on the plane and the point on the sphere with the same Gauss curvature. Now this is E constantly equal to zero, this is constantly equal to one. That's it, game over, okay? But of course this is more important than that, okay? Proof, the proof is actually a very long computation. Probably I will go three or four minutes over time, but let's see. What can we do? Well, how do we do it? Let's take a patch of a surface. Now, I didn't. In fa okay. The point is now, the funny thing is that in the proof, you don't see S prime and the isometry. So now, suppose you have one, take S, 
So take, in fact, a chart for the surface S. Take x from u to s chart. Okay? So the key point, and in fact the crucial part of the proof, I mean the idea, now it's a long computation trying to prove what? That I can write down the Gauss curvature at a given point in terms of the first fundamental form of the surface. Remember the definition. The definition is eg minus f squared uh, little divided by eg minus f squared. So the Gauss curvature is born as something which depends on the second fundamental form. Okay? So now the strategy of the proof is exactly to prove that this strange eg minus f squared, the strange, because the determinant is nothing strange, but this eg minus f squared can be expressed, expressed in terms of capital E, capital F, capital G, and maybe derivatives. In fact, you have to do derivatives of capital E, capital G, and capital F, first and second. Okay? It doesn't matter how bad this formula will look like at the end. This proves the theorem. Because we, by the theorem we started with. Because if two surfaces are isometric, there are patches for which the, the two first fundamental forms are the same. But if the two first fundamental forms are the same, whatever this horrible formula will look like, it will give the same result. OK? So don't be surprised. S prime doesn't exist in the proof. So the, the, key, the point of the proof is, show me that eg minus f squared, little, is in fact a function of capital E, capital G, capital F, and its derivatives. OK? So what do we do? Well, we take a chart. Of course, everything is local. It's around a point. So I take a chart. If I prove it on a chart, it's done. Okay. So now I have xu, xv. So by, but in general, they will not be orthonormal, of course. Okay, they will be orthonormal if and only if uh, e is equal to g is equal to 1 and f is equal to 0. So orthonormalize it. Okay, apply Gram-Schmidt. Ortho normalize xu, xv, and get e1, e2. Okay? This is just a way to define what are E1, E2. Basically, E1 is what? E1 is XU divided by X norm. And E2 is the ortho in the orthogonal direction. So then it also means, since now these two are orthonormal, if I add the normal vector to the surface, I have a, a, a an orthonormal basis of R3. Okay, so every vector in R3 can be expressed as linear combination of E1, E2, and N. Okay, very well. So write notation. Uh, so I have E1, E2, and I write D, E, I. Okay, I will be an index which goes from 1 to 2. Okay, it's either 1 or 2. So D, E1, E2, I call it E, I, comma, U. Okay, and D, E, I, D, V, I call it E, I, V, comma, V, okay? Notation, nothing, just to simplify a little bit the formula. But for example, these vectors, these are vectors of R3. So can be expressed in terms of E1, E2, and N. So let's give a name to the possible coefficients. So E1, for example, E1, U. Okay, the only thing I know is that since E1 has norm 1 at every point, its derivatives will be orthogonal. Okay, so if I express it in terms of E1, E2, and N, there will be no term in E1. Do you agree? So there is nothing in the first slot. But there is something that could, I mean, in general, there will be something in the second slot. And there will be something in the third slot. And I'm starting giving names to these coefficients, OK? E1v, for the same reason, E1v has nothing in the first slot again, but something here and here. And these are called 
alpha 2, E2, plus lambda 2, N. Now let's play the same game with 2, E2, U. Well, now it will have something in the first and nothing in the second. And why this is still? Three coordinates. Sorry, wh where do you see three coordinates? Sorry. It's okay. So, E21. E2U, sorry. E2U is what? Well, it will have something here, nothing here. But should I put a beta or, or is it something that I know? It's something I know. Because the scalar product between E2, U, okay, minus alpha 1, E1, nothing, plus, and here is something I don't know, so I call it Mi1, N. So why here there is minus this? Well, because, of course, I have the equation E1, E2 is equal to zero. The scalar product, E1, E2 is equal to 0. Okay? And that gives me this condition, okay? And then I have the last one, E2V, which is for the same reason, minus alpha 2 E1. Oh, sorry, this becomes plus. Plus alpha 2 E1 plus mi 2 N, okay? Okay, check it. No, 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 this one is plus. Okay, let's, let's derive them. Okay, I will go five minutes extra time, okay? So how do you do it? Well, what do I get from E1, E2 is equal to zero. This is what I know, okay? So what if, so this is equal to zero. This implies what? I can take the derivative with respect to U, and this is tel tells me what? That E1, so this implies that E1, U, E2, plus E1, E2, U is equal to 0. Okay? So E1, U, E2 is, of course, alpha 1. And E2, U, E1 is this one. So this is minus alpha 1. So where do I get this one? Because you might say, why don't I take the derivative with respect to V? V, E to V. Yeah, that looks like a minus now. Yeah. Okay. But by the same, for the same reason, if I put V, I get the same equation. And uh, okay. Let's see if. We have to go back to this point, but let me go. Mm, OK, so let me erase this. Okay. Now, so this is the system I, I like. Now I claim the following identities. So, and then I will prove them step by step. OK, claim. If I take E1U, E1U uh, scalar product E2V, E2V minus E1V. E to U, this is equal to lambda 1 mi 2 minus lambda 2 mi 1, but this is also equal to V alpha 1 dV minus D alpha 2 du, and this is also equal, finally, to Eg minus F squared divided by Eg minus F squared. Okay? Now, this is a claim. I mean, there is nothing obvious here, except the first. Okay, so the first is what? E1U, E2V. E1U, E2V. If I perform the scalar product between, so it's the first and the last line, what do I get? Of course, here there is nothing, nothing. So E1U, E2V is lambda 1, me 2, because N is norm 1, okay? Minus E1V, E2U. Okay, so this is 0, 0, lambda 2, mi 1. Okay, so th the first line is the only obvious one. Now, E2, 
Now let's see, how much is d alpha 1? So let's try to prove the second line. So d alpha 1 respect to v minus d alpha 2 respect to u is what? Well, what is alpha 1? Alpha 1, for example, is modulo sine e to v. Oh, sorry, there is a sign problem here. D alpha 1 dv. Where do I take alpha 1? I take alpha 1. If I take it from here, this becomes plus. Well, let's write it. Okay. So alpha 1 is, of course, the scalar product between E1u and E2. Okay. So I can write it as d in dv of the scalar product between E1u and E2. This is the first one. And then minus the alpha 2. But minus the alpha 2, I would like to write it as plus. No? Minus alpha 2 is plus, fortunately. So everything now comes back to E2V and E1. Okay, So it's plus V in DU, E2V and E1. Okay, now for some reason I prefer to have another expression for alpha 1 that I can take it from from where? Uh, of course alpha 1 I could have also picked it from here but then it would have become, let me let me decide in a moment what is best because of course at the end everything is the same but I mean something is easier to handle. So alpha 1 I can take it from here but I can take it also from here with the minus and so this would also be, let me write it on top just to decide later which one I prefer. This would be e to u, e to u, e1. Okay, so I have these two options for the first term. Okay, now if I perform the partial derivatives, this is what? This would become um, right, I definitely prefer this one. Okay, put this one. You can see immediately why, you know. Right, let's do it. This is E2, E2, UV, E1, minus. E2, UV, E1, minus E2, U, E1, V. Okay, and this is the first term. Plus E2, V, U, E1. So you see why it's better now. Plus E2, V, E1, U. Okay, so now this and this kill each other, and I'm left with these two. Okay. Are we there? Are we there? E2V, E1U minus E2U, E1V. Okay? So we proved also the second equality. Now let's go to the third. The point is, well, actually, maybe I leave this to you, OK? Observation. EG minus F squared. This is essentially under this, this object here is actually nothing like, but you can express it in this form, nu cross nv scalar product n. Okay? If you want, let's freeze it for a second. This is a nice formula. You can prove, I mean, there is nothing difficult. Eh? It's one expression for, for, this, for this thing. Believe it for a second if you want, or try to do it as an exercise, and then I can prove it for you. If this is true, let's go on and let me prove it the last equality, OK? Because this is the point. So the, but this is what? So OK, this, this will be either for you or for me next time. 
But from now on, what is NU cross NV N? Well, but N, if this is an orthonormal basis, N is nothing but E1 cross E2, okay? So this is NU cross NV scalar product E1 cross E2, okay? And how do you perform the double, I mean, the, this is one of the nightmares of first year students, okay? Scalar product of two cross products. It's first, first times third, second, fourth, minus first, third, minus, minus second, third, okay? So this is, this is first, first, and one, and you, E1 times second fourth and V E2 minus now the ones mixed in the other way. First fourth and new E2, first fourth, second third, and V E1. Okay, this is linear algebra nonsense, okay? And now how do I manipulate this? I tell you that this is equal to uh, N. So, N U E1, every time I see a derivative of something, I can put the derivative on the other side using a, always the equation N scalar E equal to zero because one is normal and one is tangent. So they are orthogonal. So the derivative with this object here, I can put the u here, I can put the v here, and so on. Okay? Changing sign. But fortunately, it's quadratic, so I don't even have to change sign. I do it twice for, every, for everything. Okay? And I prefer this because this becomes everything. So n will be not n e1 u times n e2 v minus n e2 u n e1 v okay and now and now let's go back to the definitions what is n e1 u well n e1 u is lambda 1 okay so this is lambda 1 n e2 v is me too. Minus n e to u, n e to u, me one, and lambda two, okay? So you see, it's kind of strange the way you prove, because we prove this by hand, by essentially by definition. Then we prove this is equal to this, and this is equal to this, okay? So they all together are the same, okay? But now what is the, actually the key, the key equation among all this mess, don't worry, I think even Gauss thought it was a mess. But it's here the conceptual part is crucial. The point is that this, this is the Gauss curvature. So the key equation is actually the last. Okay? Because now, well maybe now we should stop. I'll finish the proof next time. The key point is to prove that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are functions of the first fundamental form. Okay? Once you prove, but the, the key, the important point is that you understand that this is the end of the story. If I prove that alpha, thanks to this equation, if I prove that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are functions of the first fundamental form, the theorem is proved. Because then the Gauss curvature will be an even more complicated expression in the first fundamental form and, they are the, and its derivatives. No matter how complicated it is, the theorem is staying, the theorem is proved by the first theorem of today. Okay, so we are left with these two things, this and this, okay? We will start, actually we will start on Monday, I think. I think there is a, we, we, 
Okay. 